In this two video series, we'll look at the history of American art. In this first video, we'll cover from Native Americans through the late 19th century. Native American art, of course, extended as far back as the original cave stone paintings thousands of years ago. By the time of European arrival, Native American art was as diverse as the Native Americans themselves, from the distinctive painted clay pots of the Anasazi Indians of the Southwest to the famously carved totem poles of the Northwest Indians. Native American art was overwhelmingly symbolic, laden with spiritual imagery and revolving around the natural world. It often told a story. Artistic designs were part of native weaving and clothing, for example. Art was evident in ceremonial mask. Most Native Americans, however, didn't create art for simply its artistic value, and in fact, few Native American languages even had a distinctive word for art. There was no recognized vocation of artist in most Native cultures. In the 17th century, a few European artists and map makers came to America to draw and paint what they saw. Such art was popular back in Europe as a representation of what the New World was like. One of the earliest such artist explorers was John White, who as early as the late 16th century drew pictures of Native Americans he saw, and you can see one of them here on the right. In the 17th century, the Puritans discouraged most artwork as sinful, the lone exception often just tombstones. This strict Puritan theology faded as time passed. By the late 17th century, the portraits that did exist often still had religious messages or undertones. For example, a bird might symbolize the soul, a metaphor that extended back to the biblical Psalms. Almost all still skewed color and decoration. During the 18th century, wealthy colonists would pay portrait artists to come and paint them, a sign of distinction. The portraits would, of course, take time, and the artist would simply stay with the family. The price for the painting was by what was shown and, and the size of the canvas. The cheapest simply was a head, sometimes unfinished regarding any background. The artist frequently charged by the appendage as shown. Now, how did this arrangement came to term, quote, costing an arm and a leg? A full body portrait with the background and on a large canvas was naturally the most expensive. Of course, there were no portraits of less affluent colonists. Most American colonists simply couldn't afford artwork. Throughout the colonial era, English styles remained popular. The open book with thumb inserted as if to suggest a pause in continuous activity was a common way for English portrait painters to signal that their subjects were ladies or gentlemen, as well as to indicate the occupations of clergyman, writer, or magistrate. Swords and canes symbolize power and status as well as occupation, while rings, shields, and other heraldic devices established family and class positions. One of the most successful of the early American portrait painters is Gilbert Stuart, and you can see him on the bottom left here, who famously painted several portraits of George Washington, one that's on the right. And he also painted John and Abigail Adams, James Madison, James and Rowe, and even George III. As a matter of fact, he painted over a thousand portraits in his career. More affordable were engravings or copies of famous paintings. Artists would often hone their craft by studying the earlier masters and trying to replicate the classics. These copies were still expensive, however, and only available to those with the means. Sculptured statues of stone or marble was a time-consuming and delicate art in the colonial era, and not surprisingly, few such sculptures were made in the colonies. Many of the famous sculptors were trained as painters and worked out of European studios, always carving their subject from a model who would pose for days on end. By late in the colonial era, copies of sculptures made from a mold of the original were more common, but still beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest colonial Americans. By the late colonial era, however, there were American craftsmen working in wood and metal that created products considered both useful and artful, such as fine cabinetry, elaborate glassware or, cerama or ceramics, and detailed silver teapots, among many others. Sculptured busts of marble and plaster, cheaper and easier than full-bodied statues, were popular with the wealthy, often plaster copies of busts of famous people from antiquity. Just like in architecture of the period, neoclassical forms were popular. If the wealthy wanted to make a bust of a living person in the 18th century, they would need to cover the face in clay to make a life mask, a way to ensure that the later bust in plaster, bronze, or marble had the correct face. <laughs> 
The subject would lie still with their face covered in grease and their eyes closed. The artist would then cover the face with clay, leaving room through the nose for the subject to breathe. The clay mold would harden and then be removed. The artist would then take measurements of the eyes open, later carving them on the final bust according to the measurements. In 1785, the famed sculptor Houdin came to Mount Vernon to cast George Washington for a bust he planned to make in Paris. As Washington lay still on the table, his step-granddaughter came in and panicked, thinking he had died. And the final sculpture of Washington is shown uh, here. Some wealthy Americans commissioned death masks, often made the clay just after the person had died, in a, in a way to remember them. Death masks had been around since ancient Egypt. Also, tombs and crypts of the wealthy might have artistic flares to distinguish them. Again, however, art of any form was unusual for the common colonists. And you can see here on the right the death mask of Benjamin Franklin. By the American Revolution, there were a few notable American painters in Europe, such as Benjamin West, and you can see him on the top left there, and John Singleton Copley on the top right. Centered in London, they focused on painting scenes from history. At the time, that was considered the highest form of art. The American Revolution created a market for patriotic art of all forms throughout the entire 19th century, including paintings and sculptures. One of the most famous of the nationalistic revolutionary war painters was John Trumbull, and you can see him on the left there. He was sometimes called the, the painter of the revolution. One of his most famous paintings was a Declaration of Independence, painted in 1818. You can see that on the right. It's not a, a, a uh, historically accurate painting, but it almost dates back to the time of the signing. Many painters sought to distinguish the new United States from Europe by painting its vast natural beauty. This led to what many historians argue is the first school of American art, the so-called Hudson River School. Now, as its name implies, this group of painters centered in New York and focused on the beauty of areas along the Hudson River, the Catskills and, and the White Mountains. The Hudson River School painters were some of the first notable Americans to study their craft solely in America no longer traveling to Europe as most painters had before. Some of the most notable early painters in the Hudson River School included Thomas Cole, and you can see him on the left, and Asher Durand on the right. Cole and Durand reflected in many ways the transcendentalist sense that nature reflected the divine. Cole especially sought to stress in his paintings that the early Industrial Revolution was marring the United States, ruining its inheritance. To make his point, Cole painted a series of five paintings in 1836, which became famous and collectively referred to as the Course of Empire. The paintings seemed to suggest that civilization was in a feudal revolt against nature. And you see this in the sequential paintings. In the first one, this is called the Savage State, humanity is integrated into a sublime and beautiful landscape, but mankind is, is almost you know, not even noticeable here. You can see it over on the left side, one little small thing, but it's basically nature. In the second uh, picture called the pastoral state, the same scene is now much, much more tame, less majestic with images of a, a city-state landscape beginning to form, and there, there are more people. In the third of the Course of Empire paintings, entitled The Consummation of Empire, Nature was mostly disappeared behind a cluster of buildings crowded with people. Th this is where Cole was fearing America was going. You, you can't even really see nature. It's all man's creation. In the fourth painting, entitled Destruction, barbarian invaders slaughter the civilization. The clouds are, are replaced by smoke and, and you know, it's just destruction because they would gotten too far away from, from nature. And the final painting of uh, Cole's Course of Empire was the one titled Desolation. In this last painting, you can see all the people are gone, the civilization is ruined, but nature is starting to reclaim it because in the end, nature would win out. By the middle of the 19th century, a new generation, some of the Hudson River School master's students, included most not notably Frederick Evan Church, John Frederick Kinsett, and Sanford Robertson Gifford, and you can see them from the left to the right here. Notably, this new school included several women as well, such as Susie Barstow and Julie Hart Beers. Church 
Kinsett and Gifford were instrumental in establishing the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City in the early 1870s. Today, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is the largest art museum in the United States and the fourth largest in the world. One unique aspect of America that was distinct from Europe and drew some artists was the frontier, the idea of an uncharted land unlike anywhere else in the world. Most notable among these Western artists was George Catlin, who traveled to the frontier numerous times as early as the 1830s to paint Native Americans. While not technically recognized as a school of art, Western art in many forms remained popular throughout American history. Later in the 19th century, for example, was Frederick Remington, who as both a painter and sculptor depicted life on the Great Plains in the late 19th century. Cowboys, Native Americans, and U.S. Calvary as most popular subjects. Remington was undoubtedly especially popular given that he created his art in the last quarter of the 19th century, when the wild frontier was vanishing forever. As America grew and prospered in the 19th century, so-called folk art grew, handmade by common local people using skills passed down among generations of specific communities, and usually reflecting traditions of that community. Folk art might be useful or just for aesthetics. Folk art, for, of course, you know, remains popular today. The desire to memorialize the Civil War led to a number of statutes and monuments of tremendous artistic value. It's estimated that over 4,000 statutes and memorials were crafted to honor the people who fought in the war. The most obvious examples are the many statutes in Washington, D.C., including, of course, the statutes of Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. Facilitating this growth in sculpting were late 19th century technological innovations in the granite and bronze industries, which helped reduce cost and made monuments more affordable for small towns. Not all of the sculptures, however, were of the same artistic value. Companies looking to capitalize on this opportunity often sold nearly identical copies of monuments to both the North and the South. Monumental statutes were part of the Lost Cause mythology surrounding the defeated South, a late 19th century attempt to downplay the importance of slavery and cast the Confederacy as a noble cause. Edward Valentine, most notably, sculpted a large number of Confederate leaders in statutes that only in recent years have been taken down. In Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, Valentine sculpted huge monumental statues of soldiers such as Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Valentine's great skills as a sculptor was evident. Probably the greatest trend in the late 19th century was landscape painting. Obviously growing from the Hudson River School, but with more diversity of subjects, it sought to inspire awe of nature, a task easier in America given its variety of natural environments. It sought to stress nature's mysticism and fr the frailty of mankind. As such, it reflected not only nationalism, but also the transcendentalist and romantic thought, which was still popular from earlier in the century. The most obvious cause of its popularity, however, was the peak of industrialization that was in transforming and urbanizing America. Landscape painting was a reaction to this transformation, the longing for a lost time. Few people in the eastern industrial centers wanted to actually venture into nature and encounter the actual messy real nature, you know, the, uh, the steep climbs, the bugs, the predators, and so forth. And so landscape painting offered many middle class people in the cities really an escapist view of their industrial and urban life. When you live in an environment like this picture here, you can come home and you see a landscape painting and it's mystical, it's beautiful, and it kind of relaxes you, you know, you appreciate it more. The famous paintings of the uh, great landscape artist were copied and they were sold to middle class people who would hang them on their parlor walls. And this was really common in middle class Victorian homes. By the late 19th century in the Victorian age, many landscape painters had really uh, sort of degenerated into sentimentalism, like the lone Indian standing kind of crying or whatnot. The first large coffee table books, but which were becoming popular at this time in these Victorian middle class homes, included landscape pictures. All of this created, you know, the desired respect for beauty and the awe of nature its, it's, its painters intended. Historians have said that there are several different types of landscape paintings. One was called the picturesque. Usually in the foreground there was a tree with branches and in the background, maybe rustic bridges, cattle, or herdsmen. 
in the garden park style of landscape painting, usually it was a grassy open field with a meandering stream or a path with the requisite sort of S shape that kind of meandered through the picture. In the Claude Glass style of landscape painting, which was named for the French artist George Claude, there was usually a, uh, the combination of pink, red, or rust, and uh, it was often at wilderness sunsets. And that helped uh, popularize the phrase, you're, like you're looking at things through a rose-colored glasses. When, you're, when you see a pleasant scene, you're, you're, you're kind of looking at things in a, in a happy, nice way. In the sublime style of landscape painting, there was a much larger, broader view of nature. It started to stress its magnificence and vastness. A sense of nature is infinite. Most American landscape painters tended to be of the sublime category, and popular among them were pictures of the Rocky Mountains. You know, it's, it's monumental, it's no covered, it's distant, and it became a, a real common uh, scene of the sublime landscape painting in America. Other subjects were like of the Niagara Falls, the Yellowstone, Yosemite, Glacier Park, and of course the Grand Canyon. Closely related to landscape painting was the popularity of luminism, a term coined in the 1950s to describe a form of nature painting in the 19th century whose emphasis was more on the intersection of light and atmosphere than the actual depiction of some natural form. Unlike more traditional landscape artists, the luminist often returned to the same locale again and again, using light and atmosphere to depict the change of seasons. More akin to clawed glass than sublime landscapes, luminism often highlighted mist from bodies of water. As the 19th century ended, luminism had grown into tonalism. Now the emphasis was even more on color than the natural form than, than before. Artists might use dark blue or green to show darkness, or, like earlier clawed glass, gold and brown to show dawn or dusk. Unlike clawed glass, or even the luminist, however, the mood often completely overshadowed the subject. One of the uh, most famous of the tonalists was the American-born painter James McNeil Whistler. About the same time in the late 19th century, Impressionism had also become popular, inspired by earlier French painters such as Claude Monet and Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Characterizing Impressionism was the emphasis on broad brushstrokes and bright colors, not minute detail. The American Impressionists often depicted intimate gatherings in bourgeois sort of environments, for example, elaborately dressed ladies strolling in the park. A woman, Mary Cassatt, became the most famous American-born Impressionist despite her gender. Moving to Paris, she befriended famous artists such as Edgar Degas. In time, more realistic paintings re-emerged in popularity. The so-called Ashcan School, first centered in Philadelphia and then in New York City, created paintings that had the feel of classical forms, but rather depicted scenes of modern and often gritty life. As so many artists in the late 19th century reacted to industrialism by stressing nature or landscapes, or alternatively, romanticizing urban life, one American painter, John Singer Sargent, became internationally famous for his portraits of his wealthy Victorian clients. Traveling to Paris, Sargent's paintings harkened back to the golden age of the 18th century portrait painters. This concludes the first of the two videos on the history of American art, this one focusing through the 19th century.